even in a symbolic way, the anti-Frank sapling. So that dedication has been called off until sometime in the spring of next year. Uh, I think there was a misunderstanding, and that was not on my part. I let the bureaucrats take care of these things. I just talked them up. Um, I think what was said was that the tree needed to bloom three times before it could be planted. And the people who were planning this ceremony um, took that to me as bloom three times to be planted. When in fact, it blooms three times and it must stay in form for three years, which makes it December of this year. So, Matt has suggested that we put any old tree in the ground and say that we're dedicating it. So we've had to call off uh, the dedication. The exhibit that was coming from the Anne Frank Center will, of course, be called off as well and not coming to this year. For those of you who had volunteered to participate in bringing all of that information and helping with the exhibit, etc., I thank you very much for your willingness to take part in what was going to be uh, the highlight of the series since its inception. Not that. But we have some. That's part of the thing. Um, the other thing, too, is that camp uh, sections one and two tomorrow morning are canceled. How many of you didn't know that? Oh, good. So you're all reading your email. Wait, I'm reading. Are you in class? Of course, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it. <laughs> I have made arrangements for your uh, papers that you need to pick up tomorrow to be available in the Sociology Department Office, which is 2084 Stevenson. You can pick them up there. Uh, I'm, you can drop off your papers, your, your notable quotes there. After the lecture, we will be handing back the papers to the students in sections one and two. Okay, the next one. This is the good news. You can earn extra credit, I've told you that, by your voluntary participation in the walk to end genocide. Kim, are you here? Is Kim here? Kim's not here. Maybe she's a few minutes late for us. Kimberly has put together the Sonoma State University team. And I have sent out information on how to contact them so that you can register for the Sonoma State team if you are not in the class but still want to attend and participate in the Walk to End Genocide. Um, come up and see me after the lecture. The other way that you can earn extra credit and attend a, a very important and special event that is held every year in Sonoma County is to attend the uh, community commemoration of Yom Kippur, which commemorates the Holocaust. And Barbara, would you tell us? It will be at the Freedom Center in Santa Rosa. Every year there is a slightly different focus. This year it will be uh, looking at the life that no longer exists, in both in, well, actually in Germany, in Poland, and in um, Amsterdam, in, in Holland, with speakers, with music, and with images. And there is also a candlelight ceremony um, where survivors light candles, and we have had young people be our escorts. Um, if anybody is interested in that event, uh, please let me know. Um, I'll see you again. Um, evidence of your participation in any of the extra credit activities will be there is a program that is handed out at the community uh, event. I'm sure there will be some kind of information that's handed out at the walk. Uh, 
certainly Kim will have your name um, if you sign up for the uh, class team. And there is one more commemoration. We're really into commemorating um, genocide in this county, and I don't say it flippantly. A very important part of our civil uh, discourse. Is, and do you know the it's the Thursday the 18th oh. at Congregation Shamari Kara, and the guest speaker is Hans Anders. Hans Anders in the uh, So, two commemorations, one watch, march, two, and genocide, which is sponsored by Jewish World Watch. Okay, gave the bad news, gave you the improving news, and now the good news. Um, I think that one of the things that has made the Holocaust Lecture Series special among institutions and places that bring this information to college students is the fact that we have a world-renowned scholar who has, from the very beginning, when we were little, um, has come and uh, shared his ideas with you and us. I told you that sometimes he comes in the beginning of the semester, and it's important information, but it doesn't quite click the same way that it will today. We have gone through the 19th century, the 20th century, the 21st century, in terms of looking at genocide we still continue to ask the question, how in the world does this happen? We know about politics, we know about geophysics, we know about all kinds of things, geophysics being George Clooney's um, satellite images. But we know all of the details, but we still are left with that lingering question, how is it that people are capable of doing this? My pleasure to introduce to you someone who's going to help you understand that. He is the King, he is a Cohen professor of Holocaust Studies at King State University in New Hampshire. <coughs> he is um, on the faculty at Auschwitz where um, military people, the U.S. Army, uh, people in governments throughout Europe are brought to try and understand exactly what happened. And he's here to help us understand the process of becoming evil. Um, why don't you give a hand to my good friend, Mark. Mark. in the position of the co-chair of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at King State College in New Hampshire. So the trip hasn't always been quite as long as this used to be, as this one is when I used to be in Washington, but it's still a trip I very much look forward to. For those of you who may not be aware, King State College is a sister institution. Your institution, one of the uh, groups it belongs to is COPLAC, which is a public liberal arts institution uh, consortium across the nation. And of the 30 or 35 schools in there, both Sonoma State and King State College are represented in that group. So a very large part of what we do at King State in terms of trying to uphold a public liberal arts mission is very, very similar to what you do here at Sonoma State as well. Our uniqueness at King State in terms of the program I'm involved in is to this point, we are the only school in the country that actually offers an entire major in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. We're in our third year of offering that major. And we think that's kind of cool, and it's a fun thing to be part of. But there's no other school in the country that offers what you offer here in terms of this lecture series, which has been going on now for how many years? Next year will be the 30th. Next year will be the 30th. Uh, I hope in some ways, and I'm sure you, you already recognize this, that you appreciate the uniqueness of what you have the opportunity to do in this Holocaust lecture series. You have wonderful faculty who are part of this. 
you have wonderful community sponsors and partners who are part of it, but having gone across the country now for years and talked, you know, dozens of times a year sometimes about the coming evil and some of the research on genocide, I can tell you that there's no other institution you could be at in this country that offers the type of lecture series that you're able to be a part of here. So it's always a pleasure for me to be here, and my goal every time I'm here is to not screw up so badly that Myrna doesn't ask me back. So, so far we're, we're doing okay, but it's always a little tenuous. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we'll do together over the next hour or so. Uh, I really want to do a few things. I want to kind of contextualize part of what we do in the field of genocide studies by thinking about genocide in the broader context of social conflict in human history. Help us think a little bit about definitions of genocide, which you've probably struggled with at different points throughout the semester. But I'll give you some of the ways that I've tried to think about it. But mainly to think with you a little bit about some of the arguments I've laid out in my book, uh, Becoming Evil. Is this something you've read this semester? Oh, yeah. Myrna's Mer Mer yeah. the only one that said yes. So <laughs> you've seen the cover of the book this semester. <laughs> I want to think with you a little bit about some of the basic arguments I try to make there, and then finally, third and finally, think with you some about what value is it in terms of genocide and mass atrocity prevention if we can understand how perpetrators are made. In other words, why does research like this matter? Why does work like this matter? Okay? So, let's start first by placing genocide in the broadest frame possible, which is social conflict in human history. As you'll see from this slide, and we're not going to go over point by point, but conflict, social conflict, inner group conflict has been part of our history from the very beginning. To the left of this slide, you'll see a lithograph of two men, Cain and Abel. This is a story that is foundational to the religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Many of you know, know this story. Some of you believe it to be literally true, some of you may see it as mythology, but however you choose to see it, I'm going to argue that this story is an important part of us understanding the role of conflict in history. The story, as some of you know, goes this way. There's only one family in the world at this time. It's Adam and Eve and their children. Cain and Abel are the two sons. Cain and Abel make the sacrifice to God, to Yahweh. For whatever reason, God looks with favor upon uh, Abel's sacrifice, and with disfavor, upon Cain's sacrifice, probably because of issues of intention, of the heart, of how the sacrifice was given. The Hebrew scriptures then go on to say that at some point in the future, and this is what you see in the picture, this is not a photograph, I should be clear about that. <laughs> a photograph at the time. But what you see in the picture is Cain falling upon his brother Abel in the field and killing him. Now, I've known this story for as long as I've known stories, probably. But it wasn't until several years ago, listening to Ada Bazell, the most widely read writer on the Holocaust, talk about this story, that the import, the impact of it hit me. Bazell points out, this is our first family in human history. Two men, and one of them becomes a killer. And what Bazell was saying is, this is the first time in Judaism, Christianity, the Islam traditions, this is the first time death makes its appearance in the world. And I understand death can come into the world any number of ways. Famine, pestilence, plague, accidents, heart attacks. I mean, any number of ways death can make its first appearance. But what Tazel reminds us of is the first time death comes into this world, it comes in the form of murder. Now, I, I would argue that this kind of sets us off in the litany of interpersonal and intergroup conflict that has defined much of history. And again, I give you a few data points here. But let me also share with you three quotes that I think of when I see this opening slide that kind of help frame it in my mind. One quote is from Leon Trotsky, who says, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And what I love about that quote is that a lot of times I'll get students, and some of you may feel this way as well, who say, all I want to study is peace. I'm not worried about the conflict piece. I don't like war. I don't want to be any part of war. I just want to close my eyes to it. In truth, I would argue you don't have that option. Even if you're not interested in war, war has an interest in you. Even if you don't participate in war, war has an interest in you, and it's impacted your lives. For many of you, as I look across and try to 
guess your age is for many of you, pretty much most of your life, you live in a country at war, at least one front, if not two fronts. Most of you don't know why without, without war being a part of your life. So even if we're not interested in this type of conflict, it has an interest in us. Second quote I think of when I see this slide comes from Winston Churchill. Churchill once said, the story of the human race is war. And I like that quote because if you think about it, <coughs> Dr. Goodman gave you an assignment for next Tuesday, and she's not doing this. I'm not planning to see you. She has no assignments. But if she gave you an assignment for next Tuesday and said, you need to tell the story of human history, but you can only do it through one perspective, through one lens. What lens could you tell that story through that would give you the best understanding of how our nation states are carved up the way they are, of how our languages are distributed the way they are, of how diseases have been distributed the way they are? I think Churchill's right. You can't find a better lens to look at human, the human history and condition than the lens of war and conflict. And the third quote I think of with this slide uh, comes from someone much further back in history, and that's Plato, who said one time, only the dead have seen the end of war. Only the dead have seen the end of war. Think about that one for a few minutes. And think about the reality of what it's communicating to us. That the only people who will ever see the end of war in their lifetimes are probably people who are going to die. Their lifetimes end. But any of us, simply by the mere fact of living in this world, have lived at times of war. Sometimes the war has been close to us, other times it's been further away. But war, I would argue, has been a constant throughout all of our human histories. If you sat down today with your great, 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 great grandparents, a lot of things you couldn't talk about them with. Fashion would be different, technology certainly different. Uh, some of the political issues may be certainly different, but there's probably one thing they lived through that you lived through as well that you can find a connection, and that is the existence of war. Again, maybe close to them, maybe a bit further away, but they lived at the time of war. And the reality of Plato's statement, only the dead have seen the end of war, is reflected in the number of deaths that have been caused by warfare over the centuries as well. As this graph shows, the 20th century, we lost close to 100 million people because of war. That's five times the number of the 19th century, 10 times the number of the 18th century. Now, a couple of important things I want to point out about this graph. One is that often people look at this and they say, well, you see this increase in war-related deaths because technology increased. We got better at killing people. And that's true. Technology did increase in ways that made mass destruction, mass murder a bit easier in some settings from a technological standpoint. But even if we take out the effects of technology, we would see that what this represents is simply an increased rise in the number of conflicts. So even if technology hasn't improved, we still see the same upward trend of death rates over the past several centuries. Second thing I want to note is about the changing impact of war today. At the beginning of the 20th century, early 1900s, if you looked broadly at war-related deaths, you found that about 90% of war-related dead were military personnel. 10% were civilians. Now let's go forward 100 years, and let's look at the reality right now. The reality right now is actually almost exactly the opposite. About 90% of people who die in war-related conflict are civilians. Only 10% are military personnel. That doesn't downgrade the men and women in our military, the world's militaries, who put themselves voluntarily in harm's way. But even they will tell you, and as Myrna said, we work a lot with military at the Auschwitz Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, and they tell us, in zones of conflict, we, the military, are the safest people. The people most at risk are women and children. They're civilians. So war has changed today, and this is important for us in genocide studies because it pushes our recognition of a responsibility to protect. War has changed today because most likely the victims are civilians, not military personnel. 
third thing I'd say about this slide. <clears throat> a lot is being made today of some opinions that even though this slide itself may be accurate, that in the 21st century, we see warfare declining and decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. Steven Pinker is a famous psychologist from Harvard who's recently published a book that's done very well in terms of sales, Better, Better Angels of Our Nature, arguing that we're becoming a more peaceful society and less warlike. Some people in conflict studies, peace and conflict studies, look at that argument and would, would agree with it. I think, though, the consensus in the field is still that you have to, if you want to make that argument that we're more peaceful, you have to define war in a very certain, strict way. And if you define war as the typical symmetrical warfare between two military armies from two different nation states, we're seeing less and less of that. And that's wonderful. We should applaud it. But if you understand war and conflict in its changing nature, asymmetrical, against civilians, involving paramilitary forces, involving an increasing number of internal civil wars, I think Pinker's argument falls flat there. I don't think we're living in a world that we would describe at this point as more peaceful. The conflict has changed. What it looks like has changed. Who it targets has changed. But if anything, I think we live in a world in which more so than at any time in recent human history, civilians are at greater risk today than they are in less risk. Now, obviously, as you know, my interests are not as much in traditional warfare, or even non-traditional warfare, as they are in genocide. So how do we define genocide? A lot of different ways we could talk about this definition. Whole books have been written about the definition of genocide, but let me try this one with you, because it's one of the ways I've come to try to understand it. One way to think about issues of human deprivation is to think about issues of to have. This, to me, is the human rights arena. That all people, simply because they're human, ought to have certain basic rights that go beyond any nationality, any age, any gender, any creed. Simply because you're human, you ought to have the right to certain things. What are some of those things? Maybe a couple. The basic human rights you should have just simply because you're human. <coughs> I'm sorry? Shelter. Shelter. Good. What else? I'm sorry? Speech. Freedom of expression. What else? Life. Life is a basic one, probably the most basic one. Security. Health care. The right to education. The right to reproduce if you choose and want to reproduce. All of these are basic human rights, and whenever they're attacked, we ought to be up saying, as a human, those rights can't be taken away from other humans. Genocide, I think, is a little bit different. Because genocide, the issue is no longer to have. We're not talking about should people have the right to education, the right to freedom of expression, the right to health care, the right to shelter. Genocide becomes the issue of to be. Now we're simply asking the question, should these people, this group of people, however defined, should they have the right to be? When we've got to that point, we've entered into the realm of genocide. We've left human rights violations, and we've kind of gone into the deepest human rights violation, which is, does this person even deserve to exist? Okay. Now, again, if you work with the UN Genocide Convention, you'll know that there are different protected groups and different scholars have suggested different definitions. So the more I work with it, the more I become convinced that this is a great starting point for us, or certainly at least for, for me, to begin thinking about genocide. So when it crosses the line from to have to to be, then we begin to talk, talk about issues of genocide. Genocide, as we know, has uh, been around with us for as long as, as we've had groups and groups in conflict. The Hebrew scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament, list several cases that in the history of genocide, of course, you can start with and say, this absolutely looks like genocide. One group of people trying to exterminate another group of people because they believe it's what God told them to do. But in the 20th century, the 1900s, we became so good, and morally upside, upside down version of the word, we became so good at genocide that scholars refer to the 20th century as the age of genocide. And in particular, in the 20th century, as Merton said, 
April, for whatever reason, has been the cruelest month in the history of genocide because we do have so many commemorations this month because for whatever reason, we have the onset of so many of the most infamous genocides of the 20th century. But we see, starting in 1904, the destruction of the native Southwest African population in present-day Namibia, what's in called Guerrero land by German colonizers. It's been interesting, the past couple of weeks, legislation's been brought forward in Germany to recognize this officially as a genocide. The legislation hasn't gone anywhere because, as you can guess, Germany's not real excited about adding another one of these to their list. So they're kind of, there's been some resistance here, but we're in the field of genocide studies. We recognize the genocidal activities in this case. The murder of a million and a half Armenians by Islamic <coughs> Turkish regime between 1915 and 1923. April 24th of every year is the day we commemorate the Armenian genocide. This is important because even though it's almost now 100 years old, Turkey still denies that this genocide ever occurred. It's important because no U.S. setting president has called this genocide. President Obama on April 24th will make a statement about what happened to the Armenian people during this time period. And he will, based on his past three statements, refer to it as mass murder, atrocities, human rights abuses, uh, gross violations of humankind, everything in the world except the word genocide. Because if he does, Turkey threatens to pull out of its diplomatic embassies here in the States, and more importantly, threatens to push the U.S. out of the military bases we have in Turkey that are important for what we're doing in the Middle East. So this is 100 years later. If someone says to you, genocide's history is not something that affects us even more anymore, a lot of ways that that's not true. But here's one example of a early 20th century genocide that still is impacting the political arena today. The implementation of Soviet man-made famine in the Ukraine in 1932-33, this is an emerging area of study within the field of genocide studies. Uh, it's estimated between 6 to 8 million Ukrainians died during this time period, not because of a naturally occurring famine, but because of the famine induced by Stalin, in large part in reprisal for what he saw as too much Ukrainian nationalist sentiment. The stories from the Ukrainian famine and genocide, which in Ukrainian tradition is called the Holodomor, these stories are among some of the most horrendous you read about in genocide studies. Parents, when children die, dismembered the children to boil the body parts in soup so the rest of the family had some form of protein to try and get through this time. After this holodomor was over, I think the number is 2,563 Ukrainians were convicted of cannibalism because that's how they survived. You can take that number, 2,563. Those were the ones accused and convicted. <coughs> How many more? How many thousands more were never accused or were accused and not convicted? It reminds us of the kind of human toll that genocide takes on its victims. The Holocaust of 1939-45, again, Yom Show is tied to the Hebrew calendar, but most often it occurs here in April. Another commemoration for us this month uh, the event in which six million Jews, two out of every three of Europe's Jews, lost their lives at the hand of Hitler's Nazi Germany. And after the Holocaust, one of the catchphrases that we began to see was this phrase, never again. Never again could we see anything like this happen. But I have a journalist friend who's fond of saying, never again <clears throat> only has meaning. If by it you mean never again, would Germans kill Jews in Europe in the 1940s? If that's how you want to use never again, it's perfectly fine. If, but if you want to use never again to mean never again would we see that type of genocidal violence, probably the better phrase is ever again. Because since this time period, we've seen genocide and mass atrocities. And, and again, I'm putting here mass atrocities, and I want to be clear that I haven't listed every case here that could be listed. Some of these cases are well recognized as genocide. Others, others of them are recognized as mass atrocities. Generally speaking, mass atrocities is an umbrella term that includes the crimes of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Occurring in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Burundi, Cambodia, East Timor, Argentina, Guatemala, Sri Lanka, Iraq, Rwanda, 
Bosnia-Herzegovina, Nepal, and Darfur. Again, some of these, the Cambodian genocide is most often commemorated in April around the world. The Rwanda genocide, in which 800,000 people died in 100 days, is commemorated uh, right now as we speak. This is the week of mourning in Rwanda. It's commemorated on April 6th and 7th because that's when that genocide unfolded. 800,000 people in 100 days understand that you can't take any 100-day period of the Holocaust and find that rate of death. I think it would be now close to 200 perpetrators of the genocide in Rwanda in face-to-face -face interviews. And we, I was just there this past January. I'll be back there late June, I think. I have to look. But so sometime soon, I'm going back. And I, I've lost count, honestly. It's, it's probably now two dozen of this group that I've talked with that report <coughs> shoulder dislocations because of how much they feel and how hard it is to hack someone to death if the machete is not sharp and the blade is not sharp. And you listen to these stories and you recognize 800,000 people in 100 days, not done with a bomb, not done with any type of sophisticated technology, but done by and large with people swinging machete or swinging masu clubs with nails driven through them so they protrude from the other side. That's hard work, <coughs> hard work, fatiguing work, killing that many people in 100 days. Uh, I was just with Mathilde here. Yeah. She was here. Yeah, you were with Mathilde last week. I was with Mathilde on Saturday and Sunday in Washington, D.C. for the commemoration of the Rwandan genocide, the 18th commemoration. Rwandans who live throughout North America, the U.S. and Canada, came to D.C. on the campus of Georgetown University, and I think about 500 people came to that. And we had a commemoration event that lasted, started at 2, and I think we finished at 8. We were six hours of uh, just people speaking about these events in Rwanda. We took a break. We had an overnight vigil that started at 11 p.m. I stayed till 1 a.m., and I simply couldn't keep my eyes open any longer I left. I think until it said it went on to about 3 a.m. with just survivors of the genocide coming to speak and coming to remember their loss and what they suffered there. Argentina is interesting here, 76 83. I was in Argentina just this past March, just a few weeks ago, because Argentina commemorates its genocide on March 24th, which is the anniversary of the coup that brought a military regime to power in Argentina. Now, Argentina is fascinating as a case study of genocide because the death toll was fairly small. The political subversives killed in Argentina numbered about 30,000. That's less than one-tenth of the population of 25 million people in Argentina. And to be honest with you, for a long time, I looked at Argentina and I thought, you know, I know terrible things happen. I know if I'm one of the 30,000, this has meaning to me. But it just hasn't kind of risen up as one of those genocides that you look at and say there's something notable here. But in Argentina, the method of death, the 30,000, the disappearances, people just grabbed out of their homes, out of their bedrooms, knocks on the door and people taken, and no recourse to finding them. People tortured in some of the most incredibly creative ways that humans can think of torturing people. And then people tied in burlap sacks and taken off in helicopters and uh, flown <coughs> out over the ocean and dropped into the ocean to their death. And what you find out in Argentina, and this is important to understand about genocide, is it's not the number of deaths that's important, it's the fact that the society was terrorized because no one knew who the next person was that would be taken. When I was there that week in, Ar in uh, March for the commemoration, it, one of the headlines of the news was that we had known in this dirty war from 76 to 83 that often pregnant women were kidnapped by the military regime, were held uh, in ESMA, a uh, secret detention center, until they gave birth to a child. They were then killed, and the child was taken and given to a member, a family of the military regime who wanted children. You have a 35-year-old, and this happened the week I was there, a 30-something-year-old man who just discovered he was a child that disappeared, that he was a child of one of these mothers who had been killed during this time. He grew up in a military household. He grew up in a household where he thought his parents were responsible 
for stopping communism and the subversives. And right now, he's trying to figure out who he is. So one of the things you have to understand about genocide is the effects are generational. They never stop just with the killing. I have a good friend who works in the field who says, really, the effect of genocide starts when the killing ends. And Rwanda would be a great example here. In Rwanda, it's estimated that over 95% of children in 1994 saw someone murdered. Not on television, didn't hear about it, didn't read about it. In front of their eyes, they saw someone chopped down, hacked to death, clubbed to death, beaten to death. Most often, those would have been family members. How does a society begin to heal when over 95% of its children have seen this, have been through this? So again, the effects of genocide aren't limited simply to the death toll. In many ways, some of the most striking effects start to come after that as societies begin to rebuild. If we look at all of these genocides and atrocities I've listed here, and we ask the question, what's the death toll from the 20th century for this? We're looking conservatively at 60 million, 60 million people who trusted their state to protect them, and their state turned on them and killed them instead. 60 million people considered life unworthy of life by their state who lost their lives in the 20th century. Now again, when you work in the field of genocide studies, it's not important because you do it. You feel like you do it because it's important. But if you think about it, the 20th century, what other misery have we inflicted on each other that led to this loss of life? 60 million. And this is a huge human problem that I'm going to argue has a human solution, and you're a part of that solution. So let's talk secondly about how this is carried out. Who are the people that do this, and what are some of the things we can learn from asking this question? I have a general principle that I've worked from uh, in close to 20 years now, working in this field, is this. That political, social, or religious groups who come to power and want to commit mass murder do. There are a lot of obstacles they have to worry about, and you help me out here. If you come to power, you're part of a group, you want to commit genocide in your community, what can stop you from doing that? What would you have to worry about? What are some obstacles you're going to have to overcome? Sarah? Oh, a group this size, and there's no one named Sarah. Really? <laughs> 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 what, what's, give me an obstacle. Yes? Oh, good. Someone here said public opinion, you said public perception. Perfect. Here's one thing you're going to have to worry about, is what is our community in, this, in country going to think about this, and what is the world going to think about it? So you'll, you'll have to worry about that. You'll have to worry about resistance from the victim group. Okay? We thought for years after the Holocaust that you know, Jews never fought back in any way in the face of that. But now when we begin to understand and unpack what resistance is, we know that every victim group, including Jews in the Holocaust, have fought back in the ways that they could in a situation where the power differential was that severe. So you have to worry about that. You have to worry about the world not only having a bad opinion of you, but actually stepping in to stop the killing. Now again, just between you and I, don't let me leave this room, you can pretty much do what you want to do in the genocide before the world can intervene. So theoretically, you shouldn't have to worry about that. But here's the one thing you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about finding the people to carry out the killing. And I'm not talking here about architects. I'm not talking about bureaucrats. I'm talking about rank and file killers. Men and women who swing the machete, who swing the masseau, who pull the triggers uh, in uh, Turkey, Armenia, who swing the shovels and the spades and the axes and all the farm implements that they can to kill, those people are the front line. So we can look throughout history, and we have cases of events that haven't been genocidal, that could have been, that have kind of been turned back because of some of the obstacles we talked about. But we've never had a case of a genocidal regime having to throw up, up, up its hands and say, as much as we'd love to commit genocide against this group, we can't do it because we can't find the killers. They can always find the killers. They can always find the people to carry this out. And in an hour or 
or so here that I'll be with you of several disturbing things, this is probably one of the most disturbing. That you can always find people to carry this out. And you can't simply say, well, that's because it's the military and they do it because they have to do what they're told. A, that's a misunderstanding of how militaries operate. B, it's a misunderstanding of the reality that much of the killing is not done by military forces and genocide. It's done by neighbors being unleashed in many cases, it seems, on other neighbors. So the two research questions then that come for me uh, from this principle are these. How many people does it take to carry out genocide and mass killing? Um, this is not a question we often ask. I teach courses at King State on genocide and comparative genocide. So students who come to my course, I'll start by asking them death tolls. And they know it. It's cultural literacy. Six million Jews died in the Holocaust. Most of us will know that. At least 800,000, maybe close to a million Rwandans died in 1994. But again, to illustrate the generational effects, I've been in Rwanda for, we've had conversations about death tolls. And I've had women in audiences stand up and say, you can't put a number on it because we're still dying. And what they're pointing to is the thousands of women who were raped during the genocide and in many cases were deliberately infected with HIV that are now facing the end of their lives 18 years later because of what happened in that genocide. So that death toll can still be fluid. 30,000 Argentinians, a million and a half Cambodians, a million and a half Armenians, but we lose two things in those death tolls. One, we lose the recognition that 800,000 people, 6 million people, didn't die at one time. How did they die? One by one by one. That's how genocide occurs. So don't let yourself get lost in the abstraction of numbers. You've never seen 6 million of anything. You don't know what that looks like. Don't let 6 million overwhelm you. Understand that that's one person, it's another person, it's another person, and eventually it's 6 million. Here's the other thing, though, we need to understand, is that every one of those people was killed by someone. They didn't just fall to their death without being pushed, without being shot, without being chopped, without being beaten. Every one of those deaths have a killer associated with it. And we don't stop to think of that question, how many people does it take to kill? Now, we'll never have an exact answer for this, because by and large, rank and file tend to escape justice. I mean, who we go after, and we should, are the architects of genocide. That's who we bring to justice. We'll go after some mid-level bureaucrats. We'll go after some pretty famous rank and file, but by and large, the rank and file escape justice and pretty much go back to doing whatever they were doing before the genocide started. The one exception, actually, is Rwanda. Rwanda's done a better job at bringing its killers to justice than probably any other genocide in the 20th century. But even in Rwanda, survivors will say to you, it doesn't feel like justice because most perpetrators served an average of about nine years before amnesty was given by the government. Is nine years sufficient justice for what they tried to do to me, for what they did to my family, for what they did to my spouse, for what they did to my children? Is nine years sufficient for that? So we don't know the exact numbers of rank and file. We can guesstimate that in the Holocaust, about 500,000 Germans, Slavs, some Slavs, Ukrainians, Croats, participated in the front lines of killing. Uh, in Shrednica, uh, former Yugoslavia, 8,000 Muslim men and boys died uh, in the one event labeled as genocide in the, form in the Yugoslav wars. Estimated about 25,000 perpetrators involved somehow in the front lines of that. Rwanda, the first time I went to Rwanda after the genocide, we already knew that the victim toll was around 800,000 or so. Uh, when I asked a the colleague there, how many people do you think were involved as killers? Actual face-to-face, -face, ranked about killers. He estimated a million. And that's kind of mind-blowing to me because we knew that it was only 800,000 victims. How could you have more perpetrators than victims? But his point was, you have so many gangs of Terra Hanwe, young boys, young men, ganging up on victims that maybe you had more killers than you actually have victims. I think in truth, our estimates in Rwanda are probably closer to around 270,000 perpetrators actually involved in the killing. But I understand we're talking about a country the size of the state of Vermont. 
It's not a big country geographically. You've got over a quarter of a million people who participated in the rank and file destruction of Tutsi in Rwanda. So how do we think about these numbers? What we have to come back to is for genocide to be successful from the perpetrator mindset, it's going to take thousands of people at the front lines who agree to kill other people one by one by one over an extended period of time. Without them, genocide isn't going to happen. But with them, genocide becomes a possibility. So my question, and this is really the one that's been driving what I've done the past couple of decades, is who are these people? Where do they come from? How are they enlisted to perpetrate this type of extraordinary evil? The safest thing we can believe is that these are just monsters who kind of rise up out of the depth somewhere and they come to do this work. But everything we know about people who perpetrate genocide really tells us that that's too simplistic an answer. There's something much more uh, complex here. I think something much more disturbing here. And that, again, is what I've focused on trying to study. So, um, this is working so well. Oh, that, now it is still working. All right. I'm not the first person to ask this question. People have asked this question before me. Um, and they come up with different answers than the ones that I want to suggest. We're talking here about an extraordinary behavior. Let me give you one example, and this is just because I think Rwanda's on my mind and heart, having just been in, in D.C. with Matil, and having just been in Rwanda in January with uh, interviewing perpetrators. Uh, I've said with perpetrator in Rwanda, who's lost track of how many people he killed and raped. I mean, he's, he's pretty honest about confessing a lot of what he did. But he tells me honestly, he can't put a number on it. Uh, he still sets in prison and he should. He can't put a number on it because it's just so many. But if you ask him, how did you get so many in a single day or two days, he'll share the recollection and he'll say, well, I chased one down and they were weak. They'd been living in the swamp, drinking swamp water. They hadn't been eating well. They're easy to catch. And I took a machete to the Achilles tendon and I named them. And they laid there and I went and I caught another. And I cut them, and I maimed them, and they laid there, and I went and did another. And he said, I do about 15, and then I come back to the first, and I may or may not choose to rape them if they were female, uh, but I would kill them. I would chop them until they were dead, and I'd go on to the next one, and I'd chop them until they were dead. And I could do that easily and quickly, but if my friends were watching, I made it last longer. And it just has a cruelty to it. As you listen to it, and you say, this is the most extraordinarily evil thing I've ever heard. And our tendency, just a natural tendency, is to look at something that extraordinary, that behavior, and say the causes of it have to be equally extraordinary. But here's our challenge for the next half hour, however long we have together, here's what we're going to have to work together. Can you take an extraordinarily evil behavior like I just described, and can we sever that relationship and for a little bit of time together, think about the ordinary origins that could lead to that extraordinary behavior. If you can do that, you kind of meet me halfway with what I've tried to do in research. Now again, not all people have taken this approach. Some people have said, no, it's extraordinary causes for that type of extraordinary behavior. It's something about the collective. Groups of people come together, bad things happen. You've all been part of groups that have come together, whether it's fraternities or sororities or uh, just groups of friends in high school or whatever that have done some bad things. And you know, sometimes groups of people come together and it seems like they lose their mind. But you've also been part of those same groups, fraternities, sororities, groups of high school friends, civic clubs, that have come together and done some incredible good. What we have to understand about groups is what groups tend to do is they amplify the tendencies of people within them. You bring a group of six, seven nasty people together, they're going to do some pretty creatively nasty stuff. Bring a group of six, seven good people together, and you've been part of these groups, you can do some incredible good. So I think it's too simple to say it's just a collective issue. I also think it's too simple to say it's all about ideology. Uh, ideology is important. Group dynamics are important. But we have to know where they have their place. Ideology means what a person believes. Are perpetrated beliefs important for what they do? Sometimes it is, but I don't think it is. I don't think most of the time it's the answer. 
Sometimes beliefs drive it. A lot of the times, what they do drives the beliefs. Let me give you an example of that. American historians, when they write about slavery in the US, one of the things they wrestle with is often people think that we had racism in the US, and that led to slavery. But I think the consensus of American historians today is we built the institution of slavery for economic reasons. Racism as an ideology developed afterwards to justify slavery, to help people feel OK about the existence of slavery as behavior. I see this often in perpetrator behavior, but the ideology develops as the killing's going on, or after the killing's been done, as a justification for the killing, but not necessarily as a reason for the killing. Much more than ideology, I see the, the influence of things like greed and opportunism and careerism. Those things tend to be much more important in driving perpetrator behavior than ideology. And finally, the two most common things, if you were to ask your friends who haven't been in this lecture series, how do you think perpetrators of genocide come to do what they do? Probably the two most common public answers would be what I call the man Nazi thesis or the bad Nazi thesis. The man Nazi thesis says that um, the heart of how perpetrators come to do what they do is pathology. They're mentally ill. They're emotionally disturbed in some way. And again, you understand the intuitive appeal of this. The perpetrator I just described to you from Rwanda, the Hutu extremist, he sounds like he should meet every definition of mental illness and pathology. And maybe his evil went on long enough, but that certainly is a state that would describe him today. But by all accounts of people who lived with him and knew him before it started, he's not pathological. There's no emotional disturbance there. He's ordinary in the most ordinary sense of the word. But we want to point to pathology because, again, that keeps it safe. It keeps it away from us. It means that there is something unique about these people, and they can be spotted. Because we always knew they would be capable of doing something like this. Uh, this was, these chapters on pathology and personality in the book were the hardest to write, and they bored me to death. And when I read the book now, for just to review it, they still put me to sleep, honestly. So if they put me to sleep, they should put you to sleep also. But they're important chapters because we have to unpack were these people pathological? i give you a simple example. In Nuremberg, we have 22 leaders on trial, 21 actually because one committed suicide, right leg, 21 leaders on trial. And the world kind of looks at Nuremberg, and it's fascinating to read uh, editorials from the Snyder newspapers. The question isn't, are the Nuremberg defendants mentally ill? The question is, how mentally ill are they? I mean, we know they're pathological because of what they did. We just don't know how deep that pathology runs. We have the opportunity of having a psychiatrist and psychologist, Douglas Kelly and Gustav Gilbert, at Nuremberg, who have actually no, uh, no hoops to go through. It's, uh, they're just kind of roaming the halls of Nuremberg jail cells, and both of them decide to stop and start asking uh, personality test questions of the defendants, giving them intelligence tests. Their findings are kind of incredible. The intelligence tests first come back, and what we see is that the, the Nuremberg defendants, the Nazis on trial, tested well above normal in terms of intelligence. The average intelligence score, the norm of, is 100. If you get a college degree, 110 typically. If you're a PhD, 120, although I is a PhD and I work with them, and I don't think that's right at all. <laughs> but average is around 100. These Nuremberg defendants are scoring well above 120. Some of them in 130, 140, kind of genius range. And this takes a breath out of the world because you thought, again, it's easier if evil people are also stupid people because that helps explain their evil. But these intelligence tests come back and you're like, these are pretty bright men. So then what do we turn to? We turn to the personality test, which is a favorite of time in this workshop, an ink lot. And the personality tests come back, and all but one of the defendants tests well within the bounds of normality. That was shocking to the world. The one defendant who tested abnormal was Julius Stryker. If you think back to your work in the Holocaust, Stryker was the editor of Der Sturma, a notorious anti-Semitic weekly. And Stryker was crazy. But here's how crazy Stryker was. 
One of the few things the Nuremberg defendants asked on their behalf was to be tried separately from Stryker. When a Nazi says of you, you're so crazy we don't want to be tried with you, you're pretty far gone. You're pretty crazy. And that's what they wanted. So Stryker, understandable. But the others who took this test, test normal. But again, it's fascinating to see kind of some of the editorial reactions to this because the world looks at it. And what do you think the response is? Yeah, the response is psychology screwed up if these men tested normal. Fortunately for us, from a historical perspective, the responses they gave to the personality test have been left behind. So we still have those today. And they've been, been reanalyzed time and time again by top experts in the field who do it blindly. They don't know who these people are. They're just analyzing the shock. And what we see time and time again is tests well within the balance of human normality. So these are architects of genocide. But we do similar studies with actual rank and file perpetrators in Copenhagen, find the same things a year later. The bad Nazi thesis is kind of the idea that, OK, if they're not pathological, then certainly there's something twisted about their personality. And again, what we're wanting here is to figure out how we can identify them. So maybe we can't see pathology because it's not there. But certainly, something about their, per per their personality, their personality is so twisted that it's blatantly obvious that they would perpetrate genocide given the opportunity. Again, to make a very long and boring uh, story short, we haven't found this personality characteristics at all, this trait, this personality cluster. And it's not for lack of looking. Personality psychologists have looked endlessly to try and help us understand is there some set of personality traits that help us understand who is most prone to prejudice, who is most prone to evil, who is most prone toward exclusionary activities and behaviors, and we simply don't find it. And it shouldn't be surprising because it kind of mirrors demographics. I mean, people want to say um, religious people aren't likely to commit these atrocities. Uh, that would come as quite a surprise to millions of victims of genocide who have been killed by religious people often by members of the church and by leaders of the church, in many cases. That uh, educated people don't commit these atrocities. That would come as quite a surprise to the million and a quarter Jews in the East who are victims of the Einstein movement. That includes doctors and lawyers and teachers and professors and opera singers and preachers. I mean, we just, you know, there's no magic personality. There's no magic demographic variable that kind of helps us understand who does and doesn't commit this type of evil. So what it leaves us with is what I think is this very disturbing conclusion, but is really, you know, someone asked me on the plane here, I don't know how this happens. I do every imaginable physical cue to indicate on a plane that I'm not open for conversation in any respect, but it still always happens. And so they get to the book and, and they're asking, you know, what's kind of the central argument of the book? And this is that very simply that it's ordinary people like you and I who commit this type of extraordinary evil. So remember the challenge I gave to you a few minutes ago? We're going to have to think about extraordinary evil, and we're going to have to push ourselves to say, rather than thinking something extraordinary causes it, we're going to think about the ordinary origins of that evil. Now this is very difficult to do. Some perpetrators of terrorism in Northern Ireland worked with hundreds of archival testimonies of Holocaust perpetrators, I think they would all say that about themselves before it started. I would never do something like this. And this argument may apply to other people, but it wouldn't apply to me. So there's a big one. We don't like the argument because we just don't want to think we could ever do it. What else is hard about the argument? What else makes it difficult for you to, to accept? Yes? It becomes closer more than reality. Good. It, good. Very good. It becomes closer more than reality. <laughs> If this evil is done by pathological beasts, twisted personalities, just done in Germany in the 1940s, if it's out there, it's all easy for us to talk about. But if the reality is, as I argue, that it's ordinary people like you and I who do it, it comes much closer to here. Okay? Uh, at the beginning of this time, I, the opening slide had the covers, the two covers of the coming evil. The second edition one you have, the first edition one. Uh, it turns out authors have very little, I control everything within the covers, but the publisher dictates titles and art and what it looks like. 
but I really liked the first edition because it had a picture of a Bosnian Serb doing the most ordinary things, getting his hair cut. And you have the barber in the background cutting the hair, and the father's background, you have a guy sitting in a chair by the front door uh, just holding a machine gun, like he's reading a magazine. And the two, the barber and the person getting his hair cut, are kind of looking into this mirror. And what I like about it is that this is really, in part, what I'm asking the readers to do in this book with me. Look into this mirror. What does it say about who we are and who we all are collectively? And again, it's interesting when I talk with groups about this, I think people kind of enjoy the discussions when we're talking about them, about Nazis, about who, who's extremists, about military juntas, about people elsewhere. But we get to this point and we start asking hard questions about us <laughs> and who we are and the communities we live in, and this is not as comfortable. Because it's not as comfortable doesn't mean it's important. Uh, Stephen Pinker, I mentioned earlier, once said that as educated people, and you're all in the process, of, as, as we all still are, becoming educated people, you hold truth in esteem. You value truth. That doesn't mean, though, that every truth you're faced with makes you feel good about who you are and the world you live in. If you value truth and you hold truth in esteem, you're going to be faced with some truths that just aren't good. They don't make you feel good about who you are. They don't make you feel good about the world you live in. But that doesn't make them any less true, just because they don't make you feel good at that moment. I think this is one of those truths that it's ordinary people like you and I who commit the vast majority of this extraordinary evil. Jan Hotzfeld is a French journalist who has interviewed perpetrators in Rwanda. Hotzfeld's written three books about the Rwandan genocide, uh, interviewing both survivors and perpetrators, and he's tried to interview the perpetrators who inflicted atrocities on the survivors he interviewed. But in one of his interviews with perpetrators, and he was working with a different set of perpetrators than I have, He's talking to a perpetrator, and the perpetrator says this, this wonderful, transparent statement. At the time of those murders, and this is someone who killed several people, at the time of those murders, I didn't even <coughs> notice the tiny thing that would change me into a killer. And I think that's a pretty honest reflection for most perpetrators. At the time of the murders, at the time of the evil, I wasn't even aware of the tiny things that had changed me into this killer. That's not an excuse. It doesn't get them off the hook. It doesn't mean they shouldn't serve time. There's no excuse to it whatsoever. It's just a recognition that evil happens slowly. Evil happens incrementally. Evil happens by steps. And at the time of the murders, most perpetrators don't even notice the tiny things that transform them into a killer. So very simply, what I've tried to do and when I continue to do my research, is I want to know what those tiny things are. I have to notice them as a researcher, because if I don't know what they are, it's just a mystery. We can't stop this from happening if we don't know how it happened. So the model I developed, and we won't spend much time with this, but you can read more about in the book, but you've seen the cover of uh, The uh, model is trying to unpack the tiny things that transform people into killers. Uh, I've set it up in kind of three pieces. One piece, I wanted to focus on the culture. What's the culture in which genocide occurs that may help us understand some of the tiny things that transform people into killers? One thing, for instance, we know is that typically, societies in which genocide occurs have strong authority orientation. Uh, people, and it's typically very male-dominated, authority orientation, where if a genocidal regime comes to power and they start requesting that people in the community uh, participate in evil, there's such a strong orientation to authority that many people begin to follow along because it's just part of a cultural tradition, part of a cultural ethos. I think this is true in Nazi Germany when Hitler comes to power. I think it's true in Cambodia. Uh, I certainly think it's true in Rwanda. In Rwanda, when we ask perpetrators, why didn't you disobey? You're walking through the streets, you have a radio, you hear that the graves are only half full, they still need to be filled with cockroaches or Tutsi, and here are the addresses of Tutsi that need to be filled. Why did you go do it? You weren't part of the military. You didn't have to obey that. 
But when we ask the question, you start to see that it almost doesn't translate culturally to the notion that authority could be questioned in that way, in that kind of situation, in that kind of circumstance. So I do think there are cultural characteristics of which we have to be aware of and start to understand the tiny things that influence perpetrator behavior. Sometimes the cultural characteristics are so severe, I get this question often, uh, people will at the end of this, I don't mean to take someone's question, so you can still use it if you want, but you know, we've talked about evil, and at the end of this, one of the ways you protect yourself is you want to ask questions about good and about people who rescue. And those are important questions, I just don't study that. There's not much help I give you there. But for me, and maybe this is clouded by what I do study, the, the question, why did the more people resist and rescue? That's not the question for me. The question for me is, why did anyone resist and rescue, given the powerful <coughs> cultural constraints that we saw in a lot of these settings? Secondly, I want to look at how the perpetrator thinks of the victim. Um, you know, again, I've worked in this for years, but it took me several years before I realized that one of the things, questions I was asking was wrong. I was trying to figure out how do perpetrators get over the moral problem of killing someone else. And really, it was probably five years into it before I realized it just was a wrong research question. Because for perpetrators, there's no moral problem of what they're doing. They're doing absolutely what they believe is, is the right thing to do. So then the question becomes, how do you come to think this is the right thing to do? I still remember a perpetrator testimony, not face to face, but on a kind of testimony in Germany. And you read through uh, trial transcripts of perpetrators and it's just mind numbing because they're just slow and they're boring, but there's this one nugget in one testimony where the perpetrator, the Holocaust perpetrator, is asked by the prosecutor, how did you come to think it was right to kill Jews? And his response is incredible. He said, it's not that I thought it was right to kill them, I thought it was wrong if I didn't kill them. Do you see the difference in that? It's not just right that I killed them, it's actually I'm doing something wrong if I don't kill them because they're such a threat to me. So how do we define the other in such a way that their extermination is justified? It's actually wrong not to kill them in some cases. How do we define the other in such a way that if a, a bug walked across the stage right now and it was bothering me, and this would upset some of you, but I'd be okay with it, that I'd just stomp it and finish it right away. And I wouldn't think about it, I wouldn't skip a beat, I wouldn't hesitate. Some of you might be gassed. But most of us would look at it and say, oh, it was an okay thing to do. The bug was bothering. It's not a, not a big deal. The bug's not part of our moral universe. How do victims of genocide become that? How do they become so far outside the moral universe that it's not only right to kill them, it's wrong if you don't kill them? Because they're that much of a danger and a threat. How do they become dehumanized? How do we disengage ourselves morally? How do they become, even beyond the humanized, become demonized in some cases? Even worse than being not human, but actually being demonic. And I think this understanding of how victims are seen in the eyes of the perpetrators is one of the most important pieces of understanding this evil. And then finally, I wanted to look at the social construction of cruelty. Uh, genocide happens because people kill with other people other humans in large numbers over an extended period of time. So what are the group dynamics that encourage or facilitate some of this behavior? Here's a good, good chance for us to practice that challenge I gave you. Think of the groups in which you live and work. Committees, athletic teams, drama troops, a choir, any group in which you live and work. A group of friends, a choir of roommates, or whatever. Think about all the group dynamics that influence you. Conformity, peer pressure, you want to appear smart, uh, you want to be fashionable, you want to be good in the group. Whatever the group's doing, you'd like to be recognized that you can do it and you can do it well also. All of those same dynamics that impact you impact perpetrators. Now what they do is different than what you do. They're killing people. So what they do is fundamentally different than what you do. But the things that influence the group dynamics, very, very similar to the things that influence the group dynamics and influence you. So when we try to understand, for instance, the brutality that we see in genocide, and we 
look, and I'll give you an example of a case of uh, perpetrators who, who attack their victims uh, in the case of genocide. They severed the testicles from the men and of the, the victims. Uh, they dry the testicles out. They sew them together to make tobacco pouches. They sever excise the vagina of women that they kill and many times raped. And they'll take the vagina and they'll turn it upside down on top of the saddle horn. <coughs> and it sits on the saddle of horse as a trophy. Where does this example come from, by the way? This is U.S. cavalry members in the 1800s and their treatment of Native Americans. Now, how do you start to explain brutality in that creative way and evil? I think part of it is you explain it the same way we understand the creativity in groups we work in. Any group you're a part of, you want to be recognized for you do what you do well. You do it creatively, you do it better than other people, you do it more easily than other people. And it sounds horrible to think that that group dynamic works in perpetrators, but again, our challenge is to say, what they do is different than what you and I do. The factors that influence what they do can be very similar to the group dynamics that influence what you and I do as well. So then finally, what have we learned in this and why does it matter? I think one reason it matters is the age of genocide is not over. I mean, we, uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm not certainly convinced that the 21st century is going to be any more peaceful than the 20th century was. Uh, we've got some significant population issues in parts of the country that are pushing the boundaries of, of limited resources. Uh, much of the conflict we see in the world is a conflict over limited resources. In Rwanda, in, Rwanda, in Africa, which is the most conflict-ridden continent in the world, seven out of 10 conflicts are over the scarcity of water. Now we have the technology and intelligence to figure out how to solve that. We haven't had the will to do it, but population resources continue to put us in peril. Right now, this is our most recent watch list, and we worked with this at the Oxford Institute, <laughs> This is our most recent watch list for 2012 of uh, countries at risk for genocide. Right now, we have 20 countries that we consider high at risk for genocide or mass atrocity. The only country on our side of the world is Guatemala, but here we see 19 other countries, and we see kind of this belt of conflict that's very common in the literature, cutting across sub-Saharan Africa up into the Middle East. Uh, the six countries we're most concerned about are Ethiopia, Sudan, Syria, Pakistan, China, and Myanmar, Burma. Um, Burma's fascinating because Burma has been number one on this list for, I think, eight years running. But if you follow the news, you know that Burma's experiencing some pretty interesting democratic upheaval. Now, it's not, it's not a democracy, but it, for a country on the verge of genocide, it's starting to kind of turn a different direction. It's like turning an aircraft carrier. It's going to take a long time to do it. But Burma started to eat back a bit from that precipice. Syria, you've kept up with if you follow the news. For about five years, we've known that Syria had all the risk factors in place. What was waiting in Syria is a trigger. What's the accelerant? What's going to get it lit and get it started? And for about the past year, we had that accelerant. Uh, in Syria. We worry about triggers in other countries that are at risk here as well. So these questions are important to us because unfortunately, Myrna and myself and everyone who else who works in the field of genocide studies, we work in a field that we want to be obsolete, but there's not any sign that this is becoming obsolete anytime soon. And then finally, could you bring me back to the last slide there? Thanks. Final thing I want to say, perfect is really the large part of what I do is try to understand how perpetrators are made, because if we can understand it, I think we can use it for prevention. Uh, part of my theoretical background is the <coughs> evil fulfillment. I think perpetrators choose to commit the evil they commit because it fulfills certain needs for them. Sometimes the needs are just material. In Rwanda, as I mentioned to you earlier, very seldom have I interviewed Hutu extremists for whom ideology is what really pushed them to it. When I talk about why they did what they did, their neighbors had a goat that they wanted, their neighbors had a radio, their neighbors had corrugated sheet metal over their adobe uh, homes, and at the end of the genocide, you'll see pictures of, of Hutus 
uh, who committed mass murder with sheets, like 10 or 12 sheets of corrugated metal strapped to their back trying to flee into the Congo. I mean, it's the only thing that's not produced indigenously in Rwanda, so it had value to it. Now, if we understand that sometimes perpetrators do what they do because certain physical needs, psychological needs, emotional needs, social needs are fulfilled, if we can figure out other ways to fulfill those needs, it doesn't mean that we need say perpetration will never happen, but we reduce the chance that perpetrators may look at genocide as a place to get needs fulfilled that aren't being fulfilled elsewhere. A large part of what I do in this is also connected with my work at the Auschwitz Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. I'll finish with this and then take your questions. AIPR is a non uh, a nonprofit, non-governmental organization. It's bi-national. We have offices in New York City and in Poland. But four or five times a year, we go to Auschwitz. And for a week at Auschwitz, and I'm the person who does the curriculum development for this, for a week at Auschwitz, we do a seminar on genocide prevention, where we basically teach people what genocide is, what the warning signs are, and what they can do to make a difference in the face of genocide mass atrocity. Some of our groups are diplomats and government officials. So we've had over 80 countries from around the world participate in seminars. Some of our groups are US military personnel. Now we've trained about 200 US military personnel in issues of genocide prevention. And we do it on the grounds of Auschwitz I. So we sit in the former prisoner, prisoner's barrack of the largest cemetery in the world. That's what Auschwitz is. And there we learn about genocide and genocide prevention. And again, we do what we do in the field because we do think, and this is where I'll finish, it's kind of where I started, that genocide is a human problem. This hasn't been given to us by some other alien galaxy or something else out there. We created it. It's a human problem. If it's a human problem, I remain absolutely convinced and optimistic about the fact that it can have a human solution. And part of your challenge going through this course and this lecture series is you're no longer ignorant. You now have to be part. You're responsible to be part of the human solution for this problem that we've created. You don't have to be an elected official to be part of it. You don't have to be a military personnel to be part of it. All of you have points of leverage in your life that I don't have and I'll never have. You know people and you connect with people that aren't part of the groups I know and connect with. You can use the leverage you have, and you're responsible to use the leverage you have, you have to make a difference in this, to recognize the extent of it as a human problem, to recognize the suffering it causes as a human problem, but also recognize it has a human solution. And you and I are absolutely part of that human solution. All right, thank you very much. Let's take time for the Because again, they're in a position I can't be in. 
their boots on the ground in zones of conflict. So we have to let them know what do you look for that you've got to recognize as a warning sign. And I'll give you one example, pretty simple but pretty powerful. Um, and it's probably been two years ago now. We were at Auschwitz I, which is the concentration camp portion of the Auschwitz complex. And the majors had toured the facility that morning, and I had been working on logistical stuff, and I just came out to breath of fresh air. And I walked by one major who was uh, actually a former uh, ranger, and he was sitting on a bench there by the pool at Auschwitz I, just sobbing. I mean, it has been, you know, I think there were a lot of commemorations until, I, you know, I sat by survivors who, uh, you know, I mean, bodies just racked with sobbing and tears. And I think the last time I've seen that was probably this U.S. Army major at Auschwitz. And I kind of sat by him, and, um, you know, I'm not the greatest person in the world, I'll be honest with you, in those settings, I don't know what to say, I don't know if he wants to be hugged or not hugged, but I kind of just sat there and let him talk, and, he's, and I asked him what, what hit him. And he said he'd just been through one of the barracks in Auschwitz on the museum display, and he'd seen a list of names of Hungarian Jews that were to be deported from Hungary and sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau and would die in 44 or 45 in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And he was in tears because he had seen a list of names on deployment to an African country, and he didn't think anything about it. And now after Auschwitz, he realized that list of names means something. And if he had known then what he knew now about list of names and registering people, he would have acted differently, probably than he did on the ground in that deployment. So if we can do that with the military personnel and with diplomats who sit in the offices of these countries and they see the stuff unfold, we're trying to reach the people at the front lines of this. And if they know what to look for, we're going to believe they'll do the right thing. It may not always happen, but we're going to hope and believe that they'll do the right thing if they know what they're seeing. Great question. Uh, when you talked about people being dehumanized or demonized. Um, sometimes, is it true that uh, the people being demonized are being accused of terrorism or of uh, genocidal intent or something of that kind? Mm -hmm. That's one of the strategies for demonizing people? Yeah, no, it is very much. Yeah, I think very often, you know, perpetrators, and maybe this is some self-justification, they convince themselves <coughs> that the target group is a threat. Sometimes the target group, just, we look at it and say, there's no way that group can be a threat. But a perpetrator mindset, what matters is what they perceive. And if they perceive the target group as a threat because they're terrorists, because they're too represented in government, because they control banking and finance or whatever it is, that will work as a form of justification for the dehumanization of it. Uh, how common is it in the um, perpetrators you've interviewed for any of them to show remorse, if it's common at all? Great question. Um, not common. I, well, I'm going to qualify that. I mentioned this actually in D.C. this past week. Um, with Hutu extremists in prison, I always see remorse, every time. But the remorse is almost always about what they're going through. They're in prison. They've lost their farm. They've heard their wife is remarried or is living with someone else. They're remorseful about what's happened to them. Relatively seldom do you feel like you hear statements of contrition and remorse for what they've done and the implications on the victim's life. That doesn't come through as often. And this is where it's such a great question because if we talk about reconciliation, what do survivors of genocide want? They want to hear the perpetrators acknowledge the implications of what they did to them. Whether that can be forgiven or not is, is personal. But at least they want to hear the perpetrators know that what they did had this impact on their lives. You don't hear that often. My experience has been you don't hear that often from perpetrators. Uh, not to say it's unheard of, but it's not the typical, typical response. Yeah. Great question. Another? Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, what were the countries in the Great Lakes region? Oh, I'm just close now. This thing, uh, which is good because, to be honest with you, that thanks. Thanks. Now, because I was going to say I'm glad it's not there, but to be honest with you. Um, 
I would have to go back and look at the names of the 14 other countries. Um, what, I mean, I know Congo is here. Yeah, you know, I have to go back and double check. I just want to make sure, and I'm hesitant. I know I can look at the little flame symbols and give you a, I can tell you what the country is. But sometimes these little flames move on their own to other places in the slides, so I found it out. So I want to be hesitant about that. But what you can do is, if you look at the bottom here, Barbara Parr, a global watch list of 2012. If you just Google Barbara Parr, global watch list, you will go to a website with just that Prevention Advisory Network. And Barbara lists each of the 20 countries and specific reasons for why they're high at risk for each of those countries. One of the factors, and actually one of the, one of the countries here listed at risk is Rwanda. One of the risk factors, there are eight risk factors. Actually, the biggest risk factor is, has a country experienced genocide before? Because what happens is, you know, genocide is seen as a viable political strategy for a country in which it's been used before. Um, and people may become desensitized, desensitized to the violence, and a lot of things that can happen there. Now, Rwanda is, is fascinating. It's not at risk because you have a <coughs> Tutsi minority in power who wants to persecute Hutu. It's at risk because you have Hutu extremists who fled the Congo that seem to be massing for retaliation killings and attempt to take over the country again at some point in the, in the future as well. So it's that instability that puts a lot of uh, post South countries at risk. We have no blueprint for how you recover from genocide. I mean, it just, you know, there's no, we don't know how this happens. So it shouldn't be a surprise that countries are very unstable and at risk in, in the part of this recovery process. That was the country I was wondering about. What's what? That was the country I was wondering about. Rwanda? Yeah. Yeah, and another great thing to point out here as well is it's not just in country dynamics. Even in Rwanda, again, when you visit Rwanda, I mean, it, it, it's clean, it's safe, it's a beautiful country. You feel just what an incredible recovery. But you have to look outside the country and realize it's in a region that's very volatile. And as much as it wants to protect itself in that region, it can't. None of us can. The volatility of the East Central African Great Lakes region is such that that's just another risk factor that affects every country in that region. One more question, or are we done? Are we done? It's the last question. All right. Thank Please you very much. Thank you.